Hurry up, sit down, scurry. Come on, let's go, let's do it. Everybody's running around. I got a uh, letter here uh, this week from his little feet group that came. I want to just encourage you all with this. The team was truly blessed by their time at Valley View Community Church. We pray that your lives and the church were touched and changed from the experience with this group coming. We know that children around the world uh, were impacted. Praise God for how your church responded. The love offering given to the ministry of His Little Feet totaled $843. There were five children sponsored through Compassion International that evening. There was interest expressed in going on a mission trip and adopting children who need a forever family. Great, great things there. His Little Feet was indeed blessed by the hospitality and generosity of the people in your church who opened their homes to the choir children and staff. The meal provided for the team was wonderful and great. Please express our appreciation again to all those who hosted and helped provide meals for the team. So I just wanted to pass that on. Awesome ministry. Thank you again for those that participated and were involved there. Uh, Father's Day, I got a couple gifts here, three gifts I'd like to give out this morning to our fathers in particular. Our message this morning is for all of us, although I will be in some point speaking to men, married, not married, fathers, not fathers, husbands, not husbands. So all that is encompassed there. Uh, we've got a small group, so your chances of getting a gift are pretty, pretty good here. If you're a father, hopefully your name is in this hat up here. I do need some assistance, though, because I don't know how to pick names very well. Um, and so could I get a couple of you young folks up here? This young man had his hand up first. This guy's got the greatest smile in the world. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Thanks for helping me out. And a young lady, Bella Boo, get up here, girl. All right, okay. So we got three gifts this morning, and the first gift is for the man who never underestimates the power, I'm standing in your way, the power of letting your light shine. Okay, you got that? So this gift, get my Westlake bag out of the way, is a 4D... Xenon flashlight, ultra beam distance of 267 meters. Yeah. yeah. Woo. All right. So who's the recipient of this? Go ahead and pick one of those names. All right. You, can you read it? Who is that guy? Can you read it? Tell it. Jerry. Terry. Terry. Godwin. Godwin. Yes. Yeah. Woo. This can also serve as a weapon, so congratulations, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay, this next gift is for the dad who understands the importance of keeping a level head. A little balanced head, okay, we need something there. So what I have this morning is a straight line laser level up to 30 feet. Ideal for home decorating. Yeah, yeah, huh? What do you think? All right, so who's this? Bella Boo, your turn. Can you read that? Speak into the microphone here. Tim Bailey. Bailey. Tim Bailey. Yeah. How about that? How about that for dad, huh? Right. Woo. Mr. Bailey, congratulations, sir. All right. Okay. All right. This last gift here, got one left here, is for the dad who needs the occasional encouragement to put the hammer down. <laughs> to put the hammer down. And so, what we have this morning is a hickory handled framing hammer for the big boy, yeah. for the big guy. So, let's let Bella do one more. Is that okay? All right, okay, whose name you got there? Ed L. no, not Ed L. <laughs> Art? Art DeVries. Art DeVries. <laughs> you never know when you may need it, buddy. I lost mine recently. You, there you so. go. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you for my, give a, give a warm hand. Thank you, babe. 
Good stuff, is And I came across this story. It humored me. I hope you find it that way, too. One night, a wife found her husband standing over their newborn baby's crib. Silently, she watched. As he stood looking down at the sleeping infant, she saw his face, a mixture of emotions, disbelief, doubt, delight, amazement, enchantment, skepticism. He would stand back, shake his head, and say, amazing, wow. <laughs> Grinning from ear to ear and touched, touched by his unusual display and the deep emotions that aroused, her eyes glistened as she slipped her arms around him. A penny for your thoughts, son. A penny for your thoughts, she whispered in his ear. And, and he replied, isn't it amazing? When you, when you take the time and really look close, how can anyone make a crib like that for $49.99? <laughs> a little humor there. Dads can be a little uh, out of the box sometimes, can't they? Out of the box. You know, oftentimes when we talk about Father's Day, we often talk about, or at least there's some anticipation of telling guys what they're not doing, what they could be doing better. Anybody hear a message? I think I've delivered a few of those. <laughs> That's not my goal this morning. My goal is to honor men, honor you guys, honor us, to share a message, to inspire, to encourage, to lift up this morning. And so that's what we're going to talk about. My goal is to honor us, honor you all, men in particular, for, God, for, for how God made you. We were made in God's image, it says. And what image is that? We're, we're to be like God. We're to display his character. And the Bible says that God is great. And we're to be like him. We're to be great and do great things. Our history tells us and shows us that in being great, someday there is sacrifice to be displayed. There's a laying down life to be practiced in being great sacrificing for the good of mankind. Our, our history is full of that. The movies that we've seen glorify that. I recently saw a clip of the gladiator again. <laughs> Here you've got this guy who's going to sacrifice for mankind, to set an example to be the forerunner. You look at the Braveheart movies that were out there. Similar, doing great things, sacrificing, leading the charge. The Passion of the Christ movie that came out 10 years ago, almost to the date. The most watched movie across the world at that time in history. A picture, a love story of what? Sacrifice, right? <laughs> Sacrifice. That's what Jesus Christ is all about. Great. And when we tell the story of his sacrifice, we're speaking to our hearts, <laughs> to you, you, you men's hearts, of wanting to be great, of wanting to lead the charge, of wanting to sacrifice because we're made in God's image. So that's a part of us. You understand that? You see that? I think we rarely talk about laying down our lives for others. Laying down our lives for a cause. The recent pastor's conference this last week, I was talking to a, a man who has seen firsthand the persecution of the church. Has seen where Christians are being persecuted and having to sacrifice for their faith. 
In Sudan, they are persecuting Christians like you and I. In Turkey, ones are being arrested for their faith. In India, and even closer than that, in Mexico, being forced out of areas because of their faith. Deep in his heart, every man has a desire to expend himself for a great cause. It's in there. Paul said, I want to suffer and die as he did so that somehow I also may be raised to life, a noble cause, a great thing. When Jesus predicted his death, Thomas and Peter immediately offered their lives as well. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. How many know of religions around the world who see it noble to sacrifice yourself for the cause? The suicide bombings, the terrorism that's going on, a noble cause. (laughs) Some time ago, in fact, last year, we had a colonel share at our men's Retreat. Jim Coy, he wrote a book, gave me another copy, Valor Gathering of, e- excuse me, of Eagles, a book compiled of Medal of Honor winners. 50 million men and women have served in the armed forces. 50 million. And f- only 3,510 have been given this distinguished medal the Medal of Honor, acts of heroism. Is that how you say that? Going beyond the call of duty, 19 double Medal of Honor winners. They didn't have enough the first time, obviously. They went back for more. A story that just grips me is about this young man, 18-year-old. A gunner sergeant and a B-29 bomber in World War II. They were in battle formation, and one of his jobs was to release a flare to indicate to the rest of the planes to get in combat formation. And in the process of that, there was a mishap with the flare, and it went off inside the plane. 10,000 degree flare. This bomb went off. It proved faulty, exploding in the launching chute and shot back in the interior of the aircraft, striking him in the face. The burning phosphorus tube obliterated his nose and completely blinded him. Smoke filled the plane, obscuring the vision of the pilot. Sergeant Irwin realized the aircraft and crew would be lost if the burning bomb remained in the plane. And without regard for his own safety, he picked it up and feeling feeling his way, crawled around the gun turret and headed for the co-pilot's window found the navigator's table obstructing his passage, grasping the burning bomb between his forearm and body. He unleashed the spring lock and raised the table. Struggling through the narrow passage, he stumbled forward into the smoke-filled pilot's compartment. Groping with his burning hands, he located the window and threw the bomb out. Completely aflame, he fell back on the floor. The smoke cleared, the pilot at 300 feet pulled the plane out of a dive. Forty-three surgeries (laughs) this guy has undergone. Two-thirds of his body burnt. What, What causes someone to do that? What causes someone 
that goes beyond, that looks at the bigger picture, the greater cause. What's behind that? A purpose outside of self, something outside of self caused him to sacrifice and say, I'm there. It's bigger than myself. I want to talk about greatness a little bit this morning. What's it look like? Is it to be pursued? What is God's idea there? Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for those that are here. Thank you, God, for being here with us. Thank you that you have a word for us. Thank you, God, that you sacrificed for us. I have a cause to live for. Encourage us this morning, Lord. Give us heart. Give us courage. Speak to us individually, I pray. Amen. Got an outline there. We're going to touch on that this morning. There are some platforms, some venues that men, men in naturally in some ways seek greatness, seek to be great. I want to give us five this morning that are common, ones that I thought of. The first one is sports. Sports is a way that people seek some sort of greatness. Right now, what is the uh, the Golden State Warriors? They win the NBA championship. Man, they're great. <laughs> they're on the top. You know the Steph Curry's and all those guys. Seeking greatness right now, the U.S. Open. How many are watching that? All right, yeah. Go Jordan, right? Jordan Spieth, 20-year-old or so, seeking greatness. I played high school football. That was about as great as I got. <laughs> but even in that, it was motivational. I had a coach that believed in us. Injured second to the last game as a senior. I'm not going to go play college football at Nebraska. <laughs> I knew that was the end of it. I was told not to play the last game because of my hip pointer. My coach, Don Fleming, was a retired scout for the Minnesota Vikings. He called the scout camp, said, hey, I got this kid. He's got this injury. What do we got for him? Is there anything we can offer him? So he pulls me out of class one day and, yeah, coach, what's up? He said, well, I know what the doctors said. They said you shouldn't play. But we both know this is your last hurrah. I call up to the scout camp and they sent me this girdle. <laughs> it was a hip pointer girdle, a special girdle you would put on, had pads on it. And they had a donut of some sort over here to protect that hip, you know middle out of it and so there wasn't constant pressure there he said I know what the doctor said here you go if you're wanting to play I'm I'm okay talk to your dad about it and my dad just said hey whatever Ed you want to do I'm okay with it and so I played that last game and we beat the current or the former Iowa State class B high school champions my last game had the best game of my career at that game. A couple touchdowns, 125 yards rush. I guess relive it now. <laughs> so we look at that venue. Sports is a venue, a platform that we seek some sort of greatness. The business world is another one. What do men, who can tell me the number one question when we meet someone or we talk to someone that we ask each other? Men, anybody? What do you do? We put a lot of emphasis in that. There's an ego there. It's an identifier. We get wrapped up in that sometimes, even too much. But yet it's a part of us. Something we gravitate to. Something we want to be good at. We want the recognition from the company. We like to set goals and meet them. We like to achieve. That's all part of it. But then you, you know one of the number one reasons, one of the number one, that's kind of a weird way to say that. There's more than one. 
reason why men quit their jobs, one of the ones way up there is not lack of money. I'm not getting paid enough. It's that I haven't been recognized for what I'm doing. No one sees it. The lack of recognition, a greatness portion of what we do. I got a little note here to wives. This is why your husband needs for you to respect them. To recognize them. To admire them. To appreciate them. It's a God-given desire to be respected and recognized. My life verse for my business is Proverbs 22.1. It says that a good name, I threw great in there. (laughs) A great name is more desirable than great riches. Something I attain to, something I work for. Another venue, another platform is in our hobbies. I mentioned golf. It's okay to be good in your golf. It's great to be good in your golf games. And guys go after it in their hobbies and improve and take lessons and do whatever the hunting guys. Some of you guys got guns I've never heard of before in my life. You practice, you want to get good at it. Fishing, equipment, and studying all that out. It's it's huge. That's a platform, a venue that we want to be great at. The fourth one is family. How many here want to have a great family? Now, I believe a family is more than just having children. That's part of it. But a family is a husband and wife. That's the first family in Genesis was a husband and wife. And we want to be great at it. We want to make progress in it. It was the bottom of the ninth inning. The Little League Pirates were down by two. The city championship was on the line. But with the bases loaded, there was still little hope. Little Billy Sims, not quite five feet tall, stepped into the batter's box, shivering with fear. It was a lot of pressure on a 12-year-old catcher. When the first pitch hung over the plate, Billy swung hard. The white orb soared high into the air, clearing the outfield fence by a car length. Home run. Pirates win six to four. Wow. (laughs) Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. Who says that? Do you think that family was proud? And I'm sure old dad got out there and said, well, yeah, good job, son. You know, I I probably taught you a little bit of that. (laughs) We want our families to be great. I was reflecting the other day, six of my children come this December will have graduated from college. <laughs> Something that I will never do. That is great. That is awesome. My daughter Michelle is leaving us. Who said that? <laughs> Colin. <laughs> She's going off to college this fall. There's a letter that she received, a reference letter. I can't reiterate enough that Michelle is a wonderful student. Teaching students like her makes my job easy. She takes risks and challenges herself to find opportunities to use her digital media, web design, and graphic design skills. This year, she is a design intern for an auction event that takes place at a local high school. She designed the entire auction catalog, creating many different ads, designing spreads, and interacting with the client. She worked under the deadlines and thoroughly satisfied the expectations of her clients, and her level of work is professional. Through my connection, she was able to land an internship at a local design shop over the summer, and they were so impressed with her level of work that she was able to stay on with them and work part-time. Her leadership in media technology class is nothing but real-world projects given to us by clients in the community. She has become our resident web design expert. 
Whenever we get a web design or coding project, we can assign it to her and can always count on her to communicate effectively with the client and produce quality work. I have been teaching a long time. And I know that you don't get many students like her and that not only excel at the curriculum, but are also wonderful people. I want our families to be great. And maybe you could get up here and probably share some similar stories. I was talking to Terry at the pastor's conference. They're in a break and we we're talking about dads. I don't even know how it even came up, but you know, my dad wasn't perfect at all. I learned a ton from him. I learned a ton from him. He was the kind of guy who tried to encourage you with negativity. <laughs> Anybody relate? Kind of that, uh, what's that called? Uh, reverse psychology. I would be up to bat. I wasn't a bad baseball player either. And he would stand behind the backstop. And he would grip the chain link fence. Throw him anything, he can't hit it. He's no good. As a way to encourage me. <laughs> it just made me matter. It didn't encourage me at all. But there were many things about him that I appreciate his influence. I believe has helped me to be a provider. That man will give the shirt off his back. He taught me discipline. <laughs> With one of these, unfortunately, Many of it was done in anger, but there's a lot that I didn't do <laughs> as a result of it. Fathers, do not, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Mark Twain said this, when I was a boy at 14, it's for young folk. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, so stupid, so not in touch. I could hardly stand to be around the old man. But when I got to be about 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. <laughs> Here's some surprising facts. The surprising fact, truth about kids is that they really want to be close to their parents. Careers and Colleges magazine conducted a survey of teenagers asking them, who do you admire? And among the males, 73% picked their fathers above everyone else. And each father needs to take advantage of that built-in. Built-in desire, built-in tendency. Charles Adams, a 19th century political fear, kept a diary. We heard this at our tie down at the pastor's conference. Doug Brown shared this. I had heard it before, I'm going to say it again. Charles Adams kept a diary, and one day he entered when fishing with my son today, a day wasted. That was in his diary. Didn't catch nothing, obviously. His son, Brooke Adams, also kept a diary, which is still in existence. And on that same day, Brooke Adams made this entry. Went fishing with my dad today. It was the most wonderful day of my life. Perspective influence. 
the last venue I have for us this morning just to look at is the church. Is the church a place to be great? I think yes. It's a place where we can expend ourselves. It's a cause that we can live for. It's a place to be great. To make a difference. When mom is a regular church goer, but dad attends infrequently, just 3% of their kids go on to become church goers, church members, church workers. When both mom and dad attend church regularly, 33% increases drastically. But here's the real bombshell. When dad is faithful, but mom never attends, 44% of the kids end up being active in the church, being participants. It's a place to be great. Jesus promised to be, uh, greatness to old, two old time, uh, two old timers, <laughs> two Old Testament men. They were old timers, yeah, you can say that. Abraham. What did he say to Abraham? I will make you, Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. (laughs) Wow. Who wants God to say that to him? How about David? I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. I've protected you. I've led you. I have been with you. That was another theme of the conference I caught, the pastor's conference. We can do great things with God. Why? (laughs) Because I am with you. Go into all the world because I am with you. In both instances, he promised these men a great name, to be great, a name that would go down in history that would affect many, that would be influential. He wants us, God wants us to grow up to be great. To be a great influence, to have a great name. To prosper, to be successful. He wants you and I to do greater things than we can even imagine. I mentioned last week or a couple weeks ago, God does not want what you want. He wants more than that. He wants more than that. It's his heart. And so my question I have on our outline is, are we to seek greatness for ourselves? What does that look like? Are we to go after it and make ourselves great? Jeremiah 45, 5. Should you then, here's the question, should you then seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For I will bring disaster on all people, declares the Lord. God wants to make us great. (laughs) He doesn't want us to get the recognition. He doesn't want us to be all puffed up because that's what it can do. He wants to be the one behind it. Look what he said to Abraham and David. I want to make you something great. Here's Jesus' attitude when two of his disciples sought greatness. I've got James and John here as an example. Here's Jesus just predicts his death. I'm going to die for you guys. I'm going to sacrifice for you. I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to take away the sins of the world. And these guys say in Mark, but I wonder who's going to be the greatest. (laughs) You or me. I want it, man. I want my position. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, this is right after he said, I'm going to die. And they're thinking about this. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's where our heads are. And he says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Make us great. We want to have a high position We want to exalt ourselves. 
the Jeremiah portion is talking about a couple brothers, Baruch, and I can't remember some of the other guys, I can't even say his name, but one had a different a position in the courts there, and the other one was jealous and said, what about me? I want to be great. I can do just as good as him. And we're told, don't seek that kind of greatness. So what is the kind of greatness, the way to greatness here? There's Jesus' response. Not so with you. Don't seek that kind of greatness. Instead, how whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The first five words are very honorable. Very much a good thing because that's part of who we are. There's that desire. Whoever wants to become great, that's a good thing. But what are the motives? What's behind that is what he's indicating, what he's saying, what he doesn't want us to do. Not so with you. Greatness is not getting our way. It's not getting recognized, so to speak, for something we've done. Greatness is a reflection of who God is. You know, I am a pretty good carpenter. <laughs> I don't know about great, but where did I get that skill? <laughs> where did I get that? God. That's who the glory needs to be given to. We were out the other night and just watching the moon, and a discussion came up with just a little sliver of the moon. Well, how, how is the sun reflecting off that moon? Because the, the moon was over here in the west, and doesn't the sun set in the west? And how is the earth in between the sun and the moon? And because it was only just a sliver. I don't know the scientific facts there. All I know is that the sun was reflecting itself on the moon. And that's what God wants us to be, is a reflection of him, because he's great. We give the glory to him. Reflected glory. And when we follow the example of Jesus when we sacrifice ourselves, when we serve. You know how to be great? Get way down here. Get down really low. Be a servant. Be the best, the greatest, the most servant. That's how you be great. The way up is down, boys. In the path of greatness, I think we have a choice in it. We can either serve or we can't. We can either exalt or we don't. It's possible to be great. I want to end with this letter here. We're going to have a baptism. Awesome time. I leave time for that. Anybody out there have an irregular dad? Most people just automatically imagine that all dads are normal. Well, some are not normal according to the world's standards. My dad was always different from the other dads. He didn't like crowds, so he didn't come to special events like award ceremonies, sports competitions, or even graduation. He was a man of few words. He never said congratulations, good job, or I love you. But in my heart, I knew he was proud of me and loved me. He just didn't know how to express it. When I became an adult, I would take him out to go eat or fishing with him, and I can still remember as if it were yesterday, his pants falling off when he walked, 
clicking his false teeth in his head. I would mention to him that he, would keep, if, if, that he should keep his teeth in place when we're out and about. But that didn't matter. The most challenging thing about being with dad was he smoked and he couldn't stop even for the duration of a single visit. I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so this made visiting him difficult. But I would give him anything in the world for those times I had with him, even if they were hard. My kids didn't get to know their grandpa. I wish they could have. He was a little schizophrenic and his mind continued to deteriorate. When they were young, he is gone now, but every Father's Day I think of him. Miss him with all of his clicking teeth and smoke and all. Maybe your dad isn't all this world says he should be either. But he's your dad. It's time to honor him. Appreciate him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being our heavenly father who is perfect. (laughs) Thank you, God, that we have you to look to. Lord, we thank you for giving us our fathers, Lord imperfect, irregular, whatever. I thank you, God, that you're unchanging. I thank you, God, that you want greatness from us, Lord. You want to make us into a great name, have a great name for you, Lord, lifting you up. It's not about us, God. It's about you, Lord. Remind us of that today in Jesus' name.